Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. Screens are now dominating our lives. And when it comes to kids, we literally don't know how much damage this is going to do. It's unprecedented. We don't have the statistics to show it. This is so new and so out of control that we literally don't know where this is going. What we do know is if we don't come up with solutions to monitor screen time, to monitor social media usage, there's going to be big, big problems. These platforms work on dopamine receptors in the same way that any other addiction, such as drug and alcohol, works. And kids are exposed to this from a very young age. My next guest has created a product called Screen Coach, which helps families manage kids' screen time and promote home harmony. Stephanie Kakras has a master's in sports psychology and is a published parenting author. And we discuss screen time, her company, and the many problems that she's solving. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to nickbrax.com or you can purchase the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com slash book. Steph, thank you so much for making the time to come on my podcast. Thanks for having me on. I always love to share a little bit about my story. And if something I say can help someone else, then that's always a bonus. I'm sure you share the same philosophy. I do. I do. And I was talking about that literally this morning because a lot of the time when you know you are sharing that kind of information um you know you're saying a lot of the same stuff all the time you can think that you, you know you can have the thought process is that this actually helping anyone you know what's what what's you know surely people aren't getting use out of this and then almost every time you'll hear someone reaching out and i'm sure from this episode as well we'll hear people um reaching out and saying that they took something from and it just it reminds you that you know people really really they want help they want support they want to have a voice they want to have you know they want to be able to speak about these things Mm, totally yeah super important so before we get into it can you give a bit of a background on yourself and the work that you do sure so i And one of these lucky people that knew from a very young age exactly what I wanted to do with my life. However, the path that I took didn't necessarily give me what I was after. So probably I have this have this really clear recollection when I was about 14 of holding space for a friend of mine who was confiding in me some issues that she had at school and with her family, etc. And she just said to me how much I helped her and I found that people would just naturally come to me with their problems and that I was a really good space holder basically Um, and sometimes I would offer advice but usually it was just that listening without judgment piece Mm. that was really like that I just really loved so I knew from a very young age that I wanted to help people to reach their full potential I didn't really want to be a psychologist as such because the thought of just dealing with clinically anxious and depressed people didn't light me up. But I was a, a quite a I was an athlete at quite a high level and I just loved the whole thought. I love sport and I love the whole thought of helping people reach their full potential. So I decided that I would like to become a sports psychologist. So I did really well at school. I was good at school and I liked it. I was, again, one of the, one of probably in the minority there that actually thrived at school, um, which, you know, a lot of people don't. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, But then I went off to uni. I went to Melbourne Uni and I studied psychology. And then I went to Victoria Uni and I did my postgrad in organizational psychology, a fourth year. And then I also did. Uh, sport and exercise sciences course and then I did my master's in sports psychology and by the end of it I was basically a broken person because I didn't learn the fundamental basic skills about how to help someone to reach their full potential all of the university that I did was extraordinarily research focused Um, And whilst I understand that it's important to be able to read research and to be informed, like to know what you're learning about and to be informed by what other research that people had done, etc. I never wanted to become a researcher. I'm not, I don't have a research brain. I'm a very practical person and applied. 
And even though my master's in sports psychology was supposed to be applied, there was still very much a fundamental research focus. And I felt like after seven years of full-time study in psychology, I had very limited skills to be actually able to help someone. So that if I was Mm. sitting in front of an elite athlete that had had a serious injury and was super anxious about getting back into playing their sport, I only had very limited cognitive behavioral therapy type uh, tools at my disposal. And because I was so broken from trying to work so hard to get to this point and really feeling like after seven years, I still didn't really have the skills that I needed to be able to help someone. Um, I had massive chronic anxiety. I had all sorts of gut problems, health problems, chronic fatigue, all the things that, all these symptoms that I believe that we get when we're not on the right path that really lights us up. So I have a bit of a, a, a passion for education and for relevant education and for education that lights kids up and that um, helps them to develop the things that they love and that they're interested in, which I feel like we don't have in our culture at the moment. And um, anyway, I, I did work with elite athletes for a while. I kind of fumbled my way through working for free and very small amounts of money And then um, after a few years of that, um, we found a life coaching organization and I went and did a life coach training course with them. And I I was thinking to myself, because my husband really encouraged me to do it. And I was thinking to myself, what am I going to learn doing this life coaching? Like I've done seven years of psych training, like seriously. Nick, in two days, I learned more about helping people to fulfill their life's purpose and mission than I did in seven years at uni. Like it was, oh my God, it was like a breath of fresh air. I felt like I'd come home. We learned all this really cool stuff about building rapport, about asking fantastic questions, about drawing the answers out of the client, about not advising them, about, you know, that the client really knows their own answers. They just need someone to hold the space to help them to, to, to find it and I like basically I found my thing after all that time mm. and I went on to then become one of their trainers because I believed in it so much I actually taught life coaches for about eight years and coached them in their own personal stuff and I absolutely loved it I have my kids of my own so I have an 18 well I just turned 19 and a 14 year old And my husband's a techie and about three or four years ago, um, him and his then business partner came up with the idea of Screen Coach, which is about helping families manage their kids' screen time. And so whilst it sort of feels like a big jump between um, life and executive coaching that I did performance coaching to, you know, running this sort of tech company with my husband now, um, the thing that really lights me up about the work is my passion for helping parents and kids with the coaching side of things. So whilst we have this amazing app and software that's going to help people to manage their screen time, what I really want to do in the future is to run training courses and coaching courses for parents to help them to help themselves, to help them have a better work-life balance, to help them to be present and connect with their kids and to use screen coach as a tool to help manage that those pesky screens that you know nearly every parent that you talk to is pulling their hair out and trying to you know moderate not just for their kids but also for themselves so that's kind of me in a in a nutshell yeah well i mean thank you for sharing that and uh, such an interesting story and and it it it, it is a frustration where a lot of like you're saying the psychology it seems to be so bedded in research in pra- in in sort of theoretical um you know bedded in theory and mm-hmm. i myself and i know so many people who have seen so many different psychologists over the years and it just didn't help and you know it, it sort mm. of hel- helped in initially in the sense of okay mm. i'm learning to have a broader understanding, but then in the, in terms of, okay, what can I actually do? What I need Mm. practicality. How do I actually make a change? It's 
really hard to find that it's not to say that mm. some psychologists don't offer that and aren't really good but it can be really tricky how do you find mm. the right way to get practical help where you can genuinely make a change because you're not going to get that if you just you know read a book mm. absolutely and you know there's there's absolutely no no way that I'm ever gonna you know um bring this profession down because there, as you say yeah. there are a lot of psychologists out there but I found as well them to be very limited in what they could actually help me with, with strategies, et cetera. And um, just really in the last sort of three years, I've learned more about the nervous system itself and about somatic experiencing and EMDR work. I don't know if you know anything about that. Do you know anything no. about the nervous system and somatic experiencing work? So um, I've, I've really delved deeply into studying this with a lady called Raquel Dubois, who's a, a world expert in it. And I'm also, it's very experiential. So I'm also in her, I've been in her therapy groups where we actually practice it. And it's basically, it's basically a body up focused therapy. Nearly all of our, our traditional psych, psych and psychotherapy, et cetera, is all mind, mind focused, brain focused, what are your thoughts? What are the stories you tell yourself? There's a little bit about emotions, but not a lot. Whereas this nervous system work is actually working with the body and with allowing your body to have a normal nervous system regulation in life so that when stressful things occur, your body, the fight or flight response triggers and your body is able to amp up. But then when those things dissipate, that your body knows that it can actually relax and go back to homeostasis. So the problem with a lot of us in this modern world, and this is the same with kids and screens and mental health, is that we are actually switched on and our body is in that, in that highly aroused state like nearly all the time because we just don't spend the time to stop and to allow, and even if we do, our body doesn't know what to do with ourselves because it's so rare and, and unknown that even when we do stop, we're like so anxious. Like if you, you know, if I leave my phone at home when I go for my walk and I realize that I've left it at home, even, you know, there's this mm. initial feeling like, oh my God, I don't have my phone, you know, and we are just so, we have been become so conditioned to being on all the time that it's really impacting our, our mental health, but it's actually not our mental health. Mental health is, it's actually our body that is impacted and it's like, it doesn't know, it's forgotten how to go back to homeostasis. And so the issues that that causes is anxiety. Um, you know, when our body is, is aroused, then our, our minds like often tick over more. We have more intrusive thoughts. And um, yeah, we've forgotten how to really have that downtime and how to relax. And it's the same with kids. And I believe that a lot of the issues with the rise in mental health in young people is that there's just, there's not that downtime because they're always feeling like they need to be connected with their friends. They don't want to miss out, you know, even as, as parents, it's difficult for us to, for teens, especially to encourage them to, you know, to, to take their phones away from them at 10 o'clock at night because in the morning, you know, their friends were up chatting till 12, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning and what have they missed out on? Mm. So, um, you know, with Screen Coach, where it actually blocks the kids off their devices at certain times, our advice to parents is to try and introduce Screen Coach to the kids as young as possible. As soon as screens sort of become, um, you know, a constant battle in the house, to nip it in the bud, introduce screen coach and get the kids into those really good habits early on so that when they become teens, it's just a natural, like this is just what we do in, in our house. And it, it just makes it a much easier transition. It's difficult. It's more difficult to bring it in, you know, later on once those habits are more ingrained. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I mean, it's, it's scary what, what, what's happening with this. Like, I mean, we, uh, we don't even know really what the long-term implications are going to be. It's such a new thing still. It's creating addictive behavior patterns. You know, it's sort of 
insane that this is actually even allowed to happen on this level. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that I grew up just before all of this happened. I was still out, you know, in a park, kicking the football with my friends, climbing trees, you know, finding things to do. And mm -hmm. I guess we, we, yeah, we just don't know what's going to happen. And, and it's such an important thing that you're doing because unless individuals and families take that step to try and manage this, it's not going to change because it's only going to get worse at the moment anyway in society. Mm. It's getting more. Well, it is getting, getting worse. Exactly. Yeah. The statistics, you know, were just released and uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics just released a new set of stats on screen time um, in February or April, March, like in the last couple of months. And, you know, it's continued to increase since the pandemic, which is just really mind blowing because you would think, whilst we were enduring all those lockdowns, you would think screen time would have got totally out of control, which it did. But, you know, since then, we haven't really pegged it back to pre-pandemic levels. It's still continuing to rise. And, you know, like we love screens in our house. Like we're a really big high-use screen family. Like people say to me, how much screen time is, is, is too much, you know? Yeah. And I would, you know, people would be horrified that our own kids are often on screens, like on the weekend. Um, if our 14 year old daughter is had a really big week and she just wants to chill, well, she might spend 14 hours like on between Netflix, YouTube, Roblox, Minecraft, Sims, like whatever it is that she's playing during the day. Um, and so like but a lot of kids wouldn't be able to tolerate that much screen time. So we've been really lucky that our kids can actually tolerate it. And when people say to me, how much screen time is too much? Then for me, it's about as long as they're getting enough exercise, enough sleep, uh, enough um, real life interaction with other people, um, then and that, and that they're not having tech tantrums and they're not having massive attitude issues um, anxiety issues, all that kind of thing, then, you know, screen time, and it's, it's as much screen time as they want, really. However, what happens is in, inevitably, if you don't manage, if as parents, you don't manage it, the kids get sucked into the vortex and they find it really, really difficult to get off. And that's actually a biochemical, re there's actually a biochemical reason for that because screens, give us do dopamine hits continuously. Yeah. So for those people who don't know about the dopamine reaction, it's basically a neurotransmitter. That's It's called the, the motivation chemical. So it's actually released in anticipation of a reward. So it actually motivates us to do something that we think that we're going to be rewarded for. Now, basically everything that we do we do so that we can get a dopamine hit, nearly everything. So even if, you know, cause we talk, Screen Coach also manages kids pocket money and parents might say to me, oh, I don't wanna pay my kids to do chores. Like they should just do them because they're part of the household. And I say to the parents, well, how's that working for you? Like, is that, act do the kids actually just do the chores because they're part of the household? Now some kids do but they're in the minority. But what you'll find is even if they're doing them just because they're part of the household, they're also doing them in anticipation of some kind of reward. So the parents might praise them. Um, they might feel good by like, if they're, if they love cleaning, they might feel good because afterwards the kitchen looks clean and they feel good that they've done something like that. So pretty much everything we do causes a little, a small dopamine hit, right? apart from things that obviously that we have to do that we don't want to do, like going to the dentist or, you know, those things in life that we, that we have to do. Um, but the thing with screens is that because it causes continuous dopamine hits, so whether we're scrolling social media and we see that people have liked our things or, you know, we see a feel good meme or we get a laugh from something or we see an interesting piece of information, it's like hit, 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 hit. And what happens is our dopamine tolerance actually goes up so that yep. in order to continuously feel motivated, we actually need more dopamine to be able to continue to feel motivated. And this is what people don't necessarily know and kids don't know about why screens are so alluring and, you know, and potentially addictive 
is because when we put them down and we walk away and we say, all right, kids, we're going to play a board game or the kids have to go to school or go and play out in the backyard, everything else in comparison, if they're using a lot of screens, it feels really boring and dull. And it's because they just don't have those that same dopamine hit and that same you know adrenaline rush if the if their boys are playing video games that are got a lot of adrenaline you know Fortnite stuff like that where it's like really go 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 again you know we're used to being in this highly highly engaged state um the psychological term is the aroused state and when i say that people usually just think of sexual arousal but i'm talking about nervous system arousal where we've got all the adrenaline running through our body and then in comparison school is just ridiculously boring because it's slow, that kids have to sit still for six hours, um, they have to listen, they have to concentrate, they have to write with their hands, which is just so slow and laborious. Hmm. And so this is where, you know, a lot of a lot of issues are coming in. Teachers are pulling their hair out, trying to keep kids engaged for, at school. Academic performance drops, kids just aren't, don't want to go, all these kind of things that... Um, are caused by too much, basically too much screen time and not enough breaks and downtime. And how different is that sort of pattern that gets built if if a kid is using social media and building these addictive patterns? How different is that to someone who say is building addic- an addiction uh, to alcohol or cocaine? In what it yeah, does it's to actually the brain? in terms of the pathways, it's no different. Which is, that's terrible. In terms of the chemical, yeah, I know it is. It really genuinely is. And the thing is, you know, the kids, like even my son, the, the schools are running a lot of um, free talks and education on cyber safety and how to be safe online and how to not talk to strangers and all this kind of thing. But even now, you know, 2023, there is absolutely no education on the and impacts of too much screen time on our eyes. You know, optometrists are reporting massive increases in short-sightedness for young children, um, you know, on our brains, on our physical health, on our gross and fine motor coordination because kids aren't using their bodies to catch balls and to be playing outside and climbing trees and riding their bikes and, you know, all these things that we need for our physical development that are just so critical, not to mention the social skills of sitting at dinner and having a conversation with people. I was out at dinner a couple of months ago. It was school holidays and we were visiting um, uh, some friends in the country and we went to a pizza place for dinner and an older couple walked in with two children who would have been about four and six, a girl and a boy. And the older couple, I assume, were their grandparents probably having them for the school holidays. And the kids sat at the table. They were well-dressed, the kids. They had their little bags. They looked like lovely kids. They weren't, they, you know, they didn't walk in screaming or, you know, being hyperactive or making disruption or anything. They literally sat down at the table and each grandparent handed them a phone so the grandma held the girl hit her phone and the grandpa gave the kid his phone. Those kids played on that phone for the whole entire dinner. I thought to myself, I kind of glanced over and I thought, oh, okay, fair enough. You know, sometimes like when our kids were little, we would have a rule that you could bring your iPad out after you finished eating, right? So before dinner, they would color or do whatever. Then usually the kids would get their food first. And then after they'd finished eating and having a conversation, then they could play on their iPad while we ate and talked. That was our rule, right? And we definitely, we're not the perfect parents, okay? Our kids' screen time is high, so I'll put my hand up and say, I'm not the perfect parent. But Nick, these kids sat for the entire duration of the meal, staring at, even when the meals came out, they were like holding the phone, looking at it like this, eating like zombies. They even had ice cream. They had a little thing of ice cream. The, par- the grandparents didn't even take the phones off them at the end of the meal when they had ice cream. Not once did the pet grandparents speak to them, engage with them. They talked to each other a little bit, ate their meal and then left. And I was just like, what is going on? <laughs> like I was so horrified. That's ridiculous. That is just, and uh, yeah. 
But what I, I mean, just, I, I couldn't stop staring. They probably noticed me staring at them, but I just couldn't stop. I was just like, surely while you're eating your food, you can take the phones off the kids and just chat to them. Like, what the hell? And then what, what are the memories for these kids when they, if, when they look back on their childhood, if they're having these experiences dominate so much of their interaction or their, you know, time, it's like, what are you, what, what is it? What memories are you creating? What, what are you actually learning? It's, um, yeah, yeah, it's so true. Not to mention the social skills. Like it's so important to be able to know how to hold a conversation in real life with an older person, with an adult for the kids you know, for the adults to ask the kids questions, be curious, be interested in what it is that they're doing. Um, you know, I mean, and, you know, and I know people would say, well, the parent, grandparents might have played with them and been talking to them all day. But yeah. I still think to be able to put your phones away while you're eating, I think is a really important piece um, because, you know, our digestion and everything, it's not good if we've got no conscious thought around when we're eating. Um Anyway, just a, a bit of a, a rant of mine. And do you, what what are there predictions about what the long term implications are going to be from these new generations of kids that are literally growing up with this, or is it unknown at the look, moment? Look, it's it's really unknown. Um, you know, like with anything. Um, you know, I'm sure that there are people who have predict, you know, predicted that we're going to have this this society of young people that are just completely useless. But the reality is, the human spirit is is very resilient, and we can learn how to adjust at any given time. Um, so I'm not actually concerned about the future of humanity or anything like that. Um, but I am concerned about young people's health and well being. And so, um, you know, I mean, already the Chinese government have stepped in. I don't know if you know that kids are not allowed to access the internet after like eight o'clock at night or play like online gaming um, because the kids, you know, collective school academic performance was dropping because kids were playing so much video games and, and online things after a certain time at night. So the government's come in and just basically put a ban on that. I don't know how they enforce that in terms of, you know, the kids tethering to a phone or whatever, but I'm pretty sure the Chinese government have got their way. But, um, you know, I was talking to a psychologist. I was in, I interviewed a number of psychologists when we created Screen Coach and she had a 17-year-old who was always on his video games and, you know, often played till early hours of the morning, et cetera. And she said, one of the difficulties is that there's always someone else on on the game you know and so it's really hard to stop when you know that someone else is there that waiting that you could play with and so we decided that we would create a movement of like no internet and no screen time say between 5 30 and 7 30 at night like for everyone unless they're doing some essential work you know like obviously in hospitals and you know if people are needing to do whatever and I thought that five nights a week even seven nights a week between 5 30 and 7 30 if we all had screen free time at that time we could prepare dinner eat dinner as a family and do either do homework read a book play piano um whatever it may be just have that time play outside if it's if it's summer or whatever and just have that time where it's just given that no one is on so the teenagers they're not missing out on all their other friends chatting i don't know how it would work but that that's one thing that I would really love to do is create a, a screen-free movement uh, at that time of night to force people to be going going to do other things. Yeah, I think it's critical, you know, that, that things like that happen. Uh, when you're saying in schools that they're educated on all these other areas, you know, cyberbullying and whatever else, but not on the addiction part, why is that? Why, why is there not a bigger push for that? I just don't think anyone has really written the curriculum and brought it to the kids' attention yeah. and brought it, I mean, brought it to the school's attention and the education department's attention. Um, so I've actually written a curriculum. Um, well, I've written the outline of it. I haven't written the whole thing for teachers to actually teach. It's called the five E's of screen coaching. So there's enjoyment where, you know, obviously we love screens and we, you know, the enjoyment is really important part of it. 
there's empowerment where you empower kids to be able to manage their own screen time and to be able to understand um, their emotional response and when they're getting attitude, when they're getting like when they're feeling like aggravated and intense so that they can stop and, and have a break. Um, there's, I'm not going to be able to remember now, You've, I've, I've put myself on the spot, education, empowerment, oh, education, yeah, well, obviously educating the kids about yeah. the pitfalls of screen time, empowerment, enjoyment. Um, anyway, there are five E's. You can hop on the myscreencoach.com website and if you scroll yeah. down, you'll see the five E's. But, you know, it's a, it's really about educating our kids and, and help them to be introspective and feel when they're getting upset and when the screens are getting too much, when, you know, for the older kids, when they're scrolling social media and it's just getting all a bit too much, um, to be able to put the phone down and say, all right, I need to have an hour's break and go and do something else. And how much time is too much? Are there scientific sort of views on that or what's, yeah, what is there a general amount that's seen to be a healthy amount and that, yeah, so so the um, the American Pediatric Association and the there's a, the Australia like there are government guidelines around you know the maximum amount of screen time that kids should have, and basically under four under I think under two basically zero screens, and they've since changed that since the pandemic unless they're FaceTiming a grandparent or something. Yeah, um, under five less than an hour a day yep. between five and 12 a maximum of two hours a day and then for teens a maximum of four hours a day yep. now if teens if teens if kids in high school are using their laptops for school then their four hours a day is often going to be surpassed just with school so I actually think yeah. that a lot of the, a lot of those recommendations are really outdated um, and the statistics around screen time are that a quarter of kids between the age of five and 14 are using screens more than four hours a day outside mm. school. So, um, you know, I think, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on what they're doing on screens and it depends on how they're actually coping with what they're actually doing. Because yeah. one hour, you know, for someone who's super sensitive, um, who's perhaps, you know, got trauma history, they've got mental health issues as well, half an hour scrolling social media might send them off the edge. Like that might be way too much for their, mm. for their mental mm. health. Um, you know, they might be better off playing a, a fun game that, you know, isn't going down the rabbit hole of all that we know that social media can be. Um, and having said that, you know, for, for parents and, you know, for anyone listening to this who does have a kid with mental health, and my son is a high video gamer and a screen user, like he suffered a lot with anxiety. And, you know, to take screens off him when he's had his really bad times would be the worst thing that we could have done because he actually right. uses them as a coping mechanism. So this is why it's, to me, it's just so critical to get something like Screen Coach or some other screen time management tools to help train the kids when they're little because when those habits are created early, it's just so much easier to then keep them rather yep. than to, you know, to, have to introduce them later when the, there's a bigger problem. That makes a lot of sense. And what you're saying there, it sounds like it's more accurate to measure not the overall screen time because I mean we're all using computers now to do our work on and you know run our um, lives more more measuring everything social like seriously media. Yeah, yeah everything so it's more measuring okay yeah. what are the you know healthy and unhealthy behaviors what are the, what's you know are you consuming content that's negative and provoking you know negative thoughts or behaviors are you spending mm. too much time on social media probably looking at those parts of it rather than the actual time on the screen sounds like it's probably a more accurate mm. way to or help, help you know a better way yeah. to manage manage the, their health on it yeah so did you have friends growing up that were high video game like gamers i did but i i never played video games to this day i don't play video games because we um 
weren't that interested and then we weren't allowed to have them until um I don't know 15 or 16 and by that point I didn't really I just didn't have interest my brother got more into it uh but yeah the, so from on my personal friendship levels it's never been a part of my life which um mm. I'm, I'm on, honestly very thankful for mm. Mm. yeah and I mean a lot of parents you know what we we got featured on a, a current affair a couple of months ago and um on the Facebook comments you know a lot of the parents were saying you know you got to be the parent you got to take the the you know the screens off the kid this is a ridiculous program like why on earth would you want like you know an app to basically do what the parents should be doing mm. but if you actually speak to the parents who do have kids in this day and age uh, apart from a very small minority you know they will they will tell you that it's really really difficult to keep kids away from screens especially once they hit high school but even still from around the age of you know eight or nine um, you know a lot of kids get their first phone around that time you know there's generally some kind of a, a gaming console at, at home or you know definitely streaming services and all that kind of stuff and it actually makes it it's actually a really difficult to to rein in the screen time for especially for certain kids who really gravitate towards it you know their social skills might not be as strong or you know a lot of autistic and ADHD kids which you know there's a lot of I think I heard a statistic recently that 10 percent of boys aged five and six are now on NDIS 10 percent so that autism and ADHD numbers are going through the roof wow. and some would say that's because we've got more awareness and there's a lot more diagnosis and people are offering help but I would argue that it's also um, an indication of the fast-paced world that we're living in and you know a lot of adults are presenting with ADHD it feels like you know, every other person on my Facebook feed has recently been diagnosed. And, um, you know, again, I would argue that, yes, it's a thing. I'm not definitely not saying it's not a thing, but I think that a lot of it is, is a, a symptom of, you know, this fast paced world that we're living in. And um, in the book Stolen Focus by Johan, someone or other whose surname I can't recall right now, yeah. you know, he, he, you know, he talks about all of his research has done into, you know, our, our addiction to screens and just being on all the time and literally two weeks of screen free time. And he found that he was able to focus. His mind was calm. You know, he was cre more creative. He could write and come up with ideas. And it was just, it's just a really interesting um you know, it's a really interesting concept. Um, and then there's another lady who wrote, wrote a book called Reset Your Child's Brain. She's a psychotherapist who saw a lot of kids with ADHD and autism and extreme behaviour profiles. And 95% of those kids, their symptoms come back to nearly nothing when wow. they do a 30-day complete screen detox. Wow. Like, it's just mind-blowing. So you know, I think we've really got to start looking at what are we doing with our kids and screens? Um, and really it's just, it's so important. And, you know, the, and then there's another reason, obviously, why the kids are glued to screens and that's because the parents are overwhelmed mm. and the parents don't have the capacity to actually spend time with their kids. It's easy for the parents to, you know, to, for the kids to be on screens all the time. And I'll put my hand up and say with my chronic anxiety issues, et cetera, you know, it's, it's been really a godsend for me to be able to put a screen in their hand yeah. and, you know, to be able to then for me to just be able to just take a few deep breaths. However, yeah. I think that everything's just gone way too far, both for adults and the kids. And, you know, it, it is, it is, it, there are some concerning things happening out there for kids and brains and even adults as well so thank you so much for supporting move your mind we're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in the book is available globally you can find all of the links at nickbrax.com book 
and we've just released the Move Your Mind community. We've currently got a men's community group, a women's community group, a general group. We're gonna be lo loading up other groups and you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events, we've got courses, we've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to, to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it, and we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that, like you're saying there, we it's eliminating the ability to be able to be still, to be creative, to be, you know, just have those moments because even, you know, when they arise now, you pull out the phone, just, okay, I've got a spare five minutes while I'm waiting for a train. I'm going to scroll through social media. Those are normally the moments where, you know, you've got nothing to do and you're pondering and then thoughts come to, you know, come up and you be creative and you solve a problem and that's healthy. We're not meant mm. to be this stimulated and yeah, the world's just exactly. not, yeah, it's not set up to support people that, or if any of us really, our brains just are not built to take in this much information and it's so overwhelming. And, you know, the only solution I can see is similar to what you're talking about with, you know, screen coach in general, you know, people taking ownership themselves and being, because it's just not going to go away. So it's so incredibly hard to, live in a society that this is just embedded this is how we live now how do you how do you sort of live in that society without you know becoming reliant on this stuff and um yeah it's tricky mm, mm, it is tricky and we need you know we need to be strong though because um we actually got a, a we had a chat message with one of our uh, customers just the other day who's got a 13 year old um that they have adopted and so she had a traumatic childhood when she came to them, she was totally addicted to screens. And recently they introduced Screen Coach about six months ago. And they said she would be in her bedroom. She would never talk to them. She had bad attitude. She was failing school. Um, and six months later, with the help of Screen Coach, she they've actually got to a point now where, because it's totally customizable, they don't actually limit her screen time at all because they limited wow. her screen time and there was pushback at the beginning. It was difficult because like with any addiction, once we start, you know, limiting it, there is pushback and you have to be really firm. But now she manages her own screen time completely. She's getting straight A's at school. She's one of the most engaged kids. She con converses with them. She has no attitude issues. And it's just been like a complete turnaround of this human being. Um, simply because they've they've basically been really firm and said all right we're going to do something about this screen time and um yeah screen coach blocked her when she when she wasn't allowed to use it she was probably getting more sleep and that's another thing that we haven't touched on is how much screen time is impacting our sleep because you know most of us you know the last thing we see when we go to sleep is our screen and you know even when we put the dim on it's still activating the, you know, putting the light in our brain. It's impacting our, our melatonin and our sleep hormones. And then teenagers are up late gaming and, you know, teenagers especially need a lot of sleep because they're growing and their brains are developing so fast. And that's a big factor in mental health as well is not getting enough sleep. Like just that one mm. thing alone can be a huge improvement in someone's health and well-being is to get enough sleep. Well, it can throw everything off. It can, it'll, if you're tired, you're more likely to be irritable and create, have bad habits and probably use the screens more and less likely to exercise and do all the things that are healthy for yeah. us. And, it and eat a, more sugar because you yeah. have more caffeine. Yeah, exactly. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Are there any, we finish each episode with five closing questions. So I'll go into those in a second. Are there any final messages you want to share with our audience when it comes to, to screens and, you know, this topic? No, uh, one thing that I would like to recommend is another podcast, if that's all right, that I listened to Please. last, just in the last few days was Emma Chamberlain has just done a podcast about her own journey with a dopamine detox. 
Yeah. So she talks about she kind of wanted to do a seven day dopamine detox and what that could look like for her. She, there's no way most of us can do a complete screen detox unless we're on holidays because we're working and we're just so, you know, we rely on our screens for so many things. But she was able to do some things like when she was driving, you know, to or waiting for something or, you know, just in that when she was cooking to not listen to a podcast, to not listen to music and to just allow herself to experience more silence, to not take her phone to bed, to not take her phone to the toilet, just some things Mm. that she felt that she could do for a week. And just about her journey with that. And it's been, it was one of the most shared podcasts of the week. And I'm not surprised because we're all secretly craving a way to, to detox from our, from our screens. And um, there's also a blog on my, on our, on my screencoach.com that I've written about how to, how to limit your iPhone use as a parent, because of course our kids, you know, they don't, they don't do what they're told. They do what they see, you know, that yeah. they learn from what we model rather than what we tell them. So you can't really be telling your, kid, your kids to get off the screens and go outside and play if you're glued to yours all the time. So, um, yeah, so there's some useful, useful blog articles on our, on our website as well. Oh, well, we'll, we'll make sure to put those in the show notes. So anyone listening, please do check them out. And on that topic, if people want to check out screen coach what's the where do we send them so our website is myscreencoach.com and most of our social media handles are my screen coach and um yeah drop me a line on facebook twitter uh if you just if you just google screen coach you'll be able to find us tiktok we're on all the things instagram linkedin right great well what <laughs> Well, yeah, as I said before, we'll have all of the links in the in the show notes. So yeah, definitely make sure anyone listening right now, please, please check it all out. So going into these closing questions here, um, these can be sort of short answers, whatever comes to mind for you. Um, the first one is, what is the best childhood memory that comes to mind for you right now? So... I really loved kindergarten. So I have really fond memories of doing jigsaw puzzles in kindergarten. And I had two friends that were identical twins with red hair. And I remember them very (laughs) fondly. Um, Yeah. So my greatest childhood memory, I think is, is the fun that I had at kinder. I love those kind of memories. That's great. Yeah. What do you think is, currently the biggest burden on mental health in society the the drive to always be achieving being more doing more having more and the fact that our self-esteem is tied to how much we have how much stuff we have and how much wealth we build and how much success we have in our career uh, rather than on the qualities of you know how much time quality time do we spend with our loved ones how much fun are we having with our kids or just in general how much fun are we having you know to me that's that's the biggest issue and I think screen time is a part of that because we use the screens to you know get more social media followers to Hmm you know, post so that we can whatever look good, all that kind of stuff. So I think, but just in general, I think the philosophy of be more, do more, have more is just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't it's it's never ending and it's never gonna make you happy. You're you're no, on a treadmill. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. You're stuck on a treadmill. Exactly. And you yeah. get to a point and you're not satisfied for a second because you you just go, oh that great. I'm there. Now let's go to the next point and no one ever really stops and celebrates their success. No one ever says, ah, let me just bask in this for, you know, 12 months and just be okay to be here where I am and, you know, appreciate what I've done to this point, et cetera. So it's a big version of, you know, social media addiction where 
you're getting the dopamine hit and you keep going, keep going. You're hoping that it's going to give you something that it never can give you because all your brain's craving is more. And that's the same as achieving things. The, you, you tell yourself that it's going to make you feel better, but you're just actually addicted to the next high, the next high, the next high, not the actual outcome or it might feel good for like five seconds. And then, yeah, so it's, it's not exactly, good. exactly. What's, what's your personal definition of happiness? Um, how much fun am I having? How present am I when I'm with my, the people that I love to be around, you know, my family, my, my friends, um, and am I making a difference like that to me, happiness and fulfillment go hand in hand. And it's not so much success that makes makes me happy it's more fulfillment and how much of a difference am i making yeah mm. what are you most afraid of <laughs> how long <have> you got <laughs> <laughs> so i have lots of fears i'm scared my, most afraid of losing my home losing everything that i own and and you know the the security of having somewhere to live um, you know, the seeing the news and reading all this housing crisis stuff really gets to me, and I've got to really moderate how much of that stuff I consume because I can really feel it. Like I'm very empathetic, like that. Um, and of course, something happening to my kids is um, something that I fear. Mm. And what are you most proud of? Um, I'm most proud of the ripple effect that I have when I connect with someone. So I imp not just impact them, but then if I can impact them, that will help impact their family. Like if I have a mother as a client, you know, that she says how much her parenting has improved or, or whatever, but not just in my work, but also in my day-to-day -day life. Like I try and bring love wherever I go so you know and I'm always encouraging people to thank the checkout chick at the supermarket you know smile and make eye contact and say how's your day going and with it not being flippant but do it with meaning you know smile and make eye contact like there was this one guy at um the kids primary school he was a dad and he would walk with a walking stick and he, I could often smell alcohol on on his breath at eight o'clock in the morning and everyone completely ignored him like he was no one would ever say hello or make eye contact and I would used to make eye contact and say hello and over the the years like I could see his health improving I could see him just having a little bit more of a pep in his step when he came to school because there was one person that would see him and acknowledge him Mm. So, you know, I'm proud of those moments that no one else will ever know about. You know, obviously I'm sharing here, but, you know, yeah. I haven't told anyone that story. Um, but, you know, that's that's the sort of thing that I'm proud of is just making every interaction as much of a positive and loving one as I can. I love that. And it's a great message to finish up on. And if everyone, if all of us could just do those little things, mm. the world will be a different place, a much better place. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, and one, and one other thing as well is one thing that I learned in my psych training was unconditional positive regard. Mm. So it was in the context of clients so that any client that walked in, no matter how they looked, what, how they were dressed, what they told you that they'd done or whatever is to always free yourself from judging them and from, you know, jumping to conclusions about, what a bad person they are and perhaps just put all that aside and say, can I have unconditional positive regard for people no matter what? And I think that if people were to practice that a lot more, especially on social media, which is just such a cesspool of criticism and horribleness, people being anonymous on there and saying anything that they like, um, then yeah, I think that we would have a lot less mental health issues and the world would be a better place completely agree well thank you so much for making the time i've yeah learned a lot and i'm sure our listeners will take a huge amount out of this so really appreciate it thanks so much for having me on thank you 
Thanks so much to Stephanie Kakris for joining me today for Move Your Mind. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to nickbrax.com or you can purchase the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com book.